Welcome everyone to the Peace and Justice Studies Association Conference. This is our 2020 online conference and this month we're focusing on polarization. If you're not yet a PGSA member, you can become a member for a great deal and have access to all of the presentations that have happened over the last three months. So I encourage you to investigate that if you haven't already. Um, again, I'm Amanda Smith Byron. I'm from Portland State University where I'm faculty in the conflict resolution program. I'm also the director of a Holocaust and genocide studies project there. And my research focuses on uh, on what does it focus on? It focuses on <laughs> uh, peace and conflict studies, in fact, with uh, an emphasis on ethno religious conflict um, and peacemaking. I'm Allison Castell, and I'm an assistant professor of rhetoric and communication at Regis University. Um, and there I, I teach um, courses in peace and conflict studies and um, around communication and dialogue. Great. So the two of us will be facilitating this session today on, um, on restorative, creating a res restorative circle around the election, the aftermath of the election. And we're really glad that all of you have agreed to join us. Um, maybe we could do a quick go round and just introduce ourselves. If you haven't um, yet put your name, you can put your name and pronouns in your uh, in your box so that we know how to refer to you. And um, should we just do a quick call out? Um, why don't we have Jose go first since you were our first guests, you and Allison's mom, who's Karen. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Jose Castell and uh, I'm Allison's father. <laughs> um, and that's my name being given out here. Um, and, uh, that's can't hear you. You can't hear me? Um, your your audio is going in and out, so yeah. just speak up. No, I think because I moved the computer, I think maybe that's, that's why. Yeah, yeah, I moved the computer. Um, now you can't you can see um, my wife who's, bes who's beside me. You can but see my hand, here she, I am. She's yeah. waving. <laughs> that's Karen. I'm the mother. <laughs> the proud mother. Good. Thank you. Swasti, do you want to go next? Oh, you're I'm muted. muted. Sorry, you're muted. You'd think you'd remember that by now. Um, I used to teach philosophy and religion, and I do applied ethics. So peace and nonviolence comes into that. Thank you. Wim? Uh, yeah, I'm reporting to you from uh, Four Seasons Landscaping, and uh, <laughs> occasionally I um, am successful at teaching about peace and conflict. Thank you. Elias? Hi, I'm Elias. I am a student at Adelphi University. I am a first year, and I am from Long Island, New York. Great, thank you. Welcome. Jace? Hi, um, I'm Jace Flores, as uh, Amanda said, and uh, I'm a student at Swarthmore, and uh, I'm, I'm taking Peace and Conflict Studies class right now, and uh, turns out I've been, like, missing my quotas on watching these, uh, <laughs> on these videos, so I'm doing a bit of, like, a rush. I think I'm going to watch, like, there's another one today, and I'm going to watch one Saturday, because then I have to write a paper and then move out of college, so there's a lot going on, so it's like, <laughs> yay! We're so glad you're interested in our topic. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy. We don't have delusions of grandeur. Yeah, right. Jeremy. Yeah, hey, I'm Jeremy Rinker. I teach in um, Peace and Conflict Studies at University of North Carolina, Greensboro, and I am very interested in this topic. I've been thinking a lot about it and kind of wringing my hands a lot about the current situation. So happy to be here. Thank you. Hannah Grace. Hi, I'm Hannah Grace and I'm in the same boat as Jace. Um, I think we're in the same class actually for intro to peace, hey. Um, and yeah, I also go to Swarthmore. Great, thanks. Anna? I'm Anna Demers. I'm a um, positive youth development educator in Northwest Wisconsin um, in, one, in my county. And sometimes I teach about um, 
piece in like Martin Luther King Jr. and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So I'm here to learn more. Awesome. Thank you. Brianne from Georgetown, maybe? Yep. Um, hi, I'm Brianne. I'm a senior at Georgetown. And um, yeah, I found out about these events from my professor, Michael Lowenthal. Oh, no. So I'm hoping in to see the conversation. Thank you. Right. Susanna? Susanna, do you have access to um, the audio? Okay, well, maybe she'll join us later. Oh, there she is. Yes, there she is. Um, I'm Susanna Martinez in Chicago. I direct the Peace, Justice, and Conflict Studies at DePaul. Oh, wonderful. Welcome. Great. Well, thank you all for being here. I'm going to share my screen and um, just go over some basics with you before we get started with our circle. Hang on. <clears throat> Um, before we get started, I just want to acknowledge that um, the restorative process is something that we borrow with respect from indigenous traditions. And I wanted to um, recognize that that restorative practices are based within the um, practices of indigenous people of America within the construct of recognition that we're all related. And also to acknowledge that Afanya Davis has worked to bring awareness to the fact that um, Af African indigenous justice is also very synonymous with restorative practice. And she introduces us to the term Ubuntu, I am because we are and we are because I am, recognizing the interconnection of us all. And she um, encourages us to focus on the restore on restorative practice um, as working lovingly to nurture a beloved community and practicing empathy, justice, liberation, and peace in our engagement with, an, with one another. So as you can see, the restorative um, practice, restorative circles are very much rooted in these traditions. And um, I wanted to honor these traditions by sharing my land acknowledgement from Portland State University. And if you all know the lands that you are on, you can um, add those into the chat. Um, Portland State University is located in the heart of downtown Portland, Oregon, in Multnomah County. We honor the indigenous people whose tradition and ancestral homelands we stand on. The Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Tumwater, and Watlala bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge the ancestors of this place and to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. So thank you if you're able to contribute to that acknowledgement in the chat. So I wanted to talk for a minute about, um, about restorative circle process and um, orient you if you're not already familiar with what, um, what circles are. Um, there are a variety of different kinds of circles that restorative um, circles can focus on. There's conflict circles that seek to restore harm. There's, um, they're used commonly in community programs and in education as a way to address conflict as it arises. And there's also consensus decision-making circles that focus on democracy and support for decision-making. Today's circle is gonna be a community building circle, um, which is proactive in contrast to responsive to harm. Although I suppose we could think of the election process as containing harm, it's more an opportunity for us to check in and to build community and relationship around our response to the election and perhaps an agenda, setting an agenda for us to take action um, as a result. The focus is to strengthen relationships and community and to recognize that there's an emergent design to it. So it's something that is not prescriptive, it's dynamic and it responds to the voices that are present here today that bring us into a mutual understanding. And as Fania Davis refers to as a form of beloved community, which are the words of Martin Luther King and recognizing that we come together in an effort, not just to get to know one another, but to 
emphasize and support these ideas of connection, these ideas of mutuality, these ideas of interdependence and interconnection that are so important to, um, to the world. Do you wanna add anything to that, Allison? Sorry. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about circle guidelines and um, recognize that um, one of the key elements of, um, of restorative circles is having a talking piece and not in the Zoom world, our talking piece may be something that we hold, but don't necessarily hold, but don't necessarily pass. It can be, it's a very trippy one because it keeps going in and out of my screen here, disappearing and reappearing. You don't have to have that <laughs> characteristic in a talking piece. But if there's something that you want to hold as you speak, this is something that we can um, sort of um, symbolically use in our virtual circle as a way to claim um, voice and to claim our space in the circle. Um, um, it's, as I say, an important part of the tradition and something that we have to sort of make do with in the virtual environment. But the guidelines also include uh, a, a, a guidance to speak from our heart as opposed to just from our head and to really be aware of um, our sort of holistic perspective um, and the presence of others and other perspectives in the circle, to also listen from our heart, to speak with respect, to listen with respect, to remain part of the circle for its entirety and to honor confidentiality of what's been shared. So these are the basic guidelines for the circle that we wanted to just introduce before we jumped in. And um, I'll turn it over to Allison to um, focus on the questions. And Allison, what do you think if I turn off the um, screen sharing so that we can see each other's faces and then you can access your questions without the PowerPoint? Does that work for you? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. So uh, welcome everybody. And a little confession is that when we organized this circle talk, we didn't know who was going to win the election. So we weren't aware of what the tenor of the room would be. Um, and even now, we're, you know, of course, we can't predict the tenor of the room, um, but it's uh, the nature of it is a little bit different had the results. Um, been different. I also just want to um, recognize in the chat that um, women, Jeremy, did acknowledge the um, indigenous roots of their land um, in Greensboro and in Ohio. So thank you for sharing that. So in this circle process, one of the difficult things about being on Zoom is that we're not in a circle. So um, we'll have to um, imagine a way to uh, pass the proverbial talking piece that would normally go around in a circle. Um, and one of the ways that we can do that is um, if it's easier for you to just call out the person that's sitting to your right on the video. Um, and if that isn't possible, or you know, um, just to, to call out a name so that we can indicate who the next person will be to speak so that the facilitators don't have to um, interrupt the process too much. And um, so we're gonna ask a series of questions and they're meant to kind of build upon each other to start off a little bit easier just to get us, you know, get us acclimated to one another. And, and the first question for me is, um, really an opportunity for us to um, find out from each other, you know, why did we join this talk, um, aside from that it was required from a class, so maybe a little bit deeper than that. Um, so uh, let me pull up uh, the questions that I have written down here is that um, just to be setting an intention for ourselves um, as we start this circle. And um, so wondering if people would be willing to share what kind of intention you have for joining the circle now that you've been introduced to what it is and what it means, um, something you might hope to gain from joining in this kind of conversation. Um, so that's, that's the first go around. And um, the other part of a circle process that we didn't mention is that nobody's required to speak. 
So if there's a time that it comes around and, and it comes to you, you, you can feel free to pass. Um, you can ask for the, the, the circle to pass you and come back to you if you need to. Obviously this question's a, a little bit easier. Um, and so I'll just start, um, start by giving my own answer and passing it to Amanda and then we'll pass it to the, to the rest of the circle. Does that sound good to everybody? Yep, thank you. So my intention and, and hope for the circle, I, I think as you know, one of the facilitators and you know, uh, imaginers of this space is just um, you know, to, to be able to open up a conversation and hear you know, multiple perspectives and to be able to connect with people around what other people are experiencing during this time. Um, even though um, there's been, you know, there's kind of been some mixed emotions for me and uh, just um, really hoping that this could be a space to explore some of that. So um, my intention is to um, be open and to sharing and listening. Pass to Amanda. Thank you. So again, the idea of this circle was born in concern for the possibility of, um, you know, all sorts of things in the in the process of this election. And my um, my interest in being part of this circle and in agreeing to be one of the facilitators of this circle was to um, create one of hopefully many opportunities for conversation and connection around um, the staggering reality of polarization within our country, regardless of who was elected, the fact that it was a close contest and the fact that it remains contested um, shows me that we need more conversation and more opportunity for sense-making. And I really am looking forward to this circle as part of that process of sense-making. I'll pass to Jose. So um, uh, I guess my intention uh, of being here uh, is to um, to hear what other people have to say um, about what's happening at the time or what has happened, um, and hopefully to share some of my thoughts. Um, uh, for me, it's been a, a painful um, three years and ten months. Um, uh, observing what has been going on in our country, both uh, politically, uh, economically, and socially. Um, and um, I, I, I want to get an understanding of how and why our country became so polarized, um, um, maybe it didn't just become polarized, um, uh, maybe it has been more, uh, it's been polarized, uh, but it has been brought out by the current situation. The polarization has been magnified by the, the, the people who are at the top at this point. And um, I'd love to hear what other people have to say about that. You want to pass to Mark? Uh, I, I pass. She is going to pass. <laughs> okay. Um, Who's, uh, let's see, um, uh, I, I think uh, to, to our right, uh, I see uh, Anna. Hi, I joined, um, I've been wanting to come to these, some of the sessions and I haven't had a chance to yet. And um, I think, um, I'm here in part, I mean, like, obviously things are very polarized. Um, I was nervous about the election last week, but was actually in a relatively good mood. It was really nice and warm here in Northern Wisconsin. Um, on top of the election last month, our sheriff and county board where I live um, cut ties with a domestic abuse shelter because they put Black Lives Matter signs out. Um, and it just felt like a call to have conversations, um, not just with the people who took those actions, but with um, everybody in the community. So I don't know if everybody in the community is on board with that yet. Um, but the sheriff did actually start a committee to talk about issues. Um, I think he's trying to brush 
the issue that was at hand kind of under the rug, but he's also willing to talk about it and I think needs some guidance. So um, I'm excited to talk a bit more about how to have like a restorative circle process. Cause I think I live in a rural county um, that emotions are definitely high here. We just don't talk about them that much. Um, so yeah, I hope, I hope being here will really be beneficial to maybe being able to do something like this right in my county. Can you pass to someone, Anna? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, oops. Oh, let's go to Jeremy. Thanks. Um, wow, well, you know, I, I think a lot of people have echoed what I would probably say in terms of just a, a roller coaster of emotions over the last few weeks with the election and the polarization. And I like the question that Jose asked about whether this is new, right? Because I think it is, I think there's been polarization um, for some time. And I guess for me, it's partly thinking of ways that I could engage other people kind of outside the, the regular choir, speak, you know, preaching to the choir folks that that really think quite differently than me some of which are relatives you know I've been on Facebook a little bit with relatives back and forth like are you kidding me <laughs> so you know just how to engage that that kind of belief in the you know in that Trump was the best president we ever had kind of a thing <laughs> and how to you know just kind of what I see is very devoid of any fact and any reality and how to engage with people like that in a productive way. Um, I think circles can certainly be part of that, but you know, just having a con just talking to others and thinking about ways they've done that, I think is probably what what brought me here. Um, and I'll go, how about to Wim? Um, so the, the head is like, all right, I have to make sure I say I'm here because Amanda and Allison are brilliant and I selfishly made my suggestions about having a circle process because I knew how meaningful it was for me in 2004. And I thought they can teach me so much about how I can do this tremendously moving activity. But the rule is not to be strategic and thank people for being awesome and giving us opportunities to learn. But I feel more vulnerable today than I expected I would. This has probably been the hardest four years of my life, but it's not like it just started being difficult. It's just that it's been profoundly shameful for me to admit to my feelings of guilt and sadness about everything that's happening. And acknowledging that it's really helpful for me to figure out how I can be better but I can't even say be better without feeling like there's a sting about how some of this stuff has changed. But I remember on election day before we knew who was going to win four years ago, the white supremacist in my classroom making the prediction about how things would turn out. And he was right. And I remember in the week following the inauguration of Trump that I was protesting about a Muslim travel ban and then going back to school the following week and having a student shout out, you're in Trump's world now, baby, when a student was sharing about having family stranded because they were from the wrong country. And they were Coptic Christians, not that it matters, she says, and not having any idea how to be a good educator and figuring out how to do anything. And, you know, like I'm relieved, but I'm still, I just still feel vulnerable, sad, and guilty. And to my right, Swasti is the next person. I'm here to see what I can learn and to get some strategies. Yesterday, something I was listening to, the person said, that's great that Biden is calling for unity 
They said, but after you've pushed me down and done this and thrown me people out and, you know, they were listing a lot of different things that the Trump administration had done and Republicans, they said, well, you can't expect me to go first. You have to go first. And I thought about that and I was like, I get that. But my mother used to say, you need a strong internal locus of control. And if we base our actions based on what others do, then we wouldn't do quite a bit of stuff. And so I'm struggling because it's like, I get what you're saying. They've pushed you, you know, they've done all this. But if we want unity, what do we need to do? And I don't know the answer to that, especially when if I want unity and you don't, what do I do? And I know the answer, the answer. I mean, I was talking to Anad Anbai and one of the people I interviewed in, in my big project. And I said, don't you get discouraged? You know, he's worked for peace. He worked with Gandhi and his dad was Gandhi's personal secretary. And I said, don't you ever get discouraged? And his answer to me was, do you care? And I was like, well, yeah, of course I do. He goes, well, then, you know, if you care, then you do what you're going to do. And I, I get that. But it's like, it's hard and I'm struggling right now. And I was in a group where I was sharing my struggle of trying to understand and somebody kind of went off and they weren't mad at me, but they said, just listening to you saying you're trying to understand is making my blood pressure grow up. Cause this is not just about understanding people, people's lives are in danger. And I just, I was like, I get that. I'm not asking you to understand. I'm struggling with trying to. So I was hoping coming here, I could, Get some strategies and just some support too. To my right is Allison and, and Amanda. So keep going, keep going. Uh, Elias. Hello. Hi. Um, so I'm not really sure how to react to all this mayhem going on these past few weeks, but I'm 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 just waiting to see what's going to happen and how everything's going to play out. And I, I guess from this meeting, I'm just hoping that no matter like what happens, I, I just hope that everything stays okay and everybody's okay and peaceful and there's no fighting or, you know, because I mean, I don't, I don't even know what to say. I just, I just hope everything's okay. That's all I'm saying. I just hope everything ends up being okay. Um, yeah, that, that's really all I have to say. I'm just, I'm, I, oh, and also I'm here to see kind of how, like what other people think about, like how to fix, I guess, a problem, the problem of polarization and how we could approach it. And um, I'm gonna pass it on to Hannah. Um, thank you. Um, I think that for me, a lot of my interest in coming to this session in particular was the idea that it's a dialogue. Um, in, as a young person, a lot of the ways that I get my information and the way that I've been getting my information um, from my peers or from publication companies has been so polarized for so long, like on social media, on my web browsers, they take into account information they know about me, like registered Democrat, young woman from this area. And they put information onto like my feed that is crafted to like continue to support those same ideas. So in a way it's almost blindsiding or like I feel blindsided that there's a whole other world of opinions and experiences out there that I'm just not getting exposure to from, you know, like the way that it's all being set up right now almost to intentionally polarize people and to get people more set in their ways. Um, so I was really interested in coming to this to see what more um, like mature and diverse perspectives were on the issues. And I think that I am gonna pop it over to Jace Flores. So I kind of let the cat out of the bag a bit earlier on uh, my intentions here, but also I do have a genuine interest in uh, politics. You know, I'm taking peace and conflict studies for a reason. And uh, I didn't know this would be a dialogue, but I'm very excited because I like talking about politics and you know such because I'm a huge political junkie, which is kind of strange some relationships, but it's fine because I like it and uh, I'm excited. 
and interested to hear what people have to uh, say about uh, uh, probably definitely one of the most interesting elections um, of my lifetime and probably one of the most interesting elections in the past like 100 years since, I don't know, 1932 or 1960, I don't know, something like that. Yeah. Uh, so who's left? Because when people have been like bouncing around, like it's not to the right of, you know, okay, uh, Gail. Hi everyone, I'm, I'm not the last one. I do think there's a couple people I can still call after me, but um, well, I guess I forgot this was gonna be a circle. I just wrote polarization on my calendar for four days, you know, PJSA polarization, 2 p.m., climate change. But I, I can definitely uh, talk now that I've found out uh, what it is. I do have a group of friends, of philosophers, mostly from New York and the East Coast where I used to live and we've been getting on Zoom once or twice a month this whole last few months before the election to talk about the election. So it's reminding me of that it is good to be able to talk to people. Um, I was on a peace team. I'm in this group called Meta Peace Team and we go to places to try to de-escalate violence. We usually go to like protest to make sure protesters and counter demonstrators don't like get into a fist fight. But there's also times when we're called to a, an event and we're told just hang around the edge of it to stop, to deter drive-by shooters because there have been some drive-by shootings around here. And so here I am with a little yellow vest going peace team and just trying to stop drive-by shooters uh, with my presence. Well, I did some of that. Uh, well, when I went to the polls on Tuesday, things were peaceful here in Detroit, so that was good. The day after we had our count every vote um, event. And so I was walking right next to Rashida Tlaib who was in our, in our group. And I was feeling like I'm like Rashida's nonviolent protester, but me with my yellow vest, I'm gonna deter like, Anybody who might want to try to harm her, I at least I told myself that because I wanted to feel like I was doing something useful. But I am, of course, concerned about uh, growing counterviolence and the fact that Trump is stoking it with his words for a long time, and even now with not accepting the results. And I have relatives like uh, one of you mentioned and I, I won't mention which of my relatives they are, but I don't know if you ever saw that film, The Brainwashing of My Dad, but it was done, and I forget the filmmaker's name, but she said, what happened to my dad? It all started when he had a long commute to work and he started listening to Rush Limbaugh. And then she like, interviews, psychologists and everything. How do these talk show hosts do it? And it's like she says, the, the viewers get addicted to anger. It's like, you can't resist turning on the radio or going to that site. And then you get angry and you don't realize you're addicted to anger. And she talked about how she had to try to detox her dad, you know? And when I heard this morning, they said Trump was so mad at Fox News for saying that Arizona won the election that he told all his followers to stop watching Fox News and watch some other right-wing cable station that he liked better. I thought, I wonder if my relatives are going to do that. And if so, is it going to get even worse? And, you know, how, how can we cope with it? You know, because I do want to reach out to everyone and, and I'm hoping, you know, that people could have a wake up moment when Trump's out of power and go, oh my God, how, how could we have been taken in by somebody who has these like selfish and criminal uh, proclivities? 
but I don't know if that's going to happen. And I, I, because if they're only watching a certain media and they will go to the media that Trump steers them to, I don't know what we are in for. But anyway, I can add more now, but this is the beginning of it. Has Brian Sandy spoken yet? Could you? No, I haven't gone yet. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so for me, the reason why I'm here is kind of similar to um, everyone else's thoughts, but to make it more specific to my experience, um, I never really had interest in politics that much until like um, recently, especially since this was the first year that I was actually able to participate in a presidential election. So I've been trying to like educate myself as much as I can on different aspects of politics. And I found the topic of polarization to be very, very interesting, um, you know, especially given the current climate and where I am on campus in D.C., I've noticed a lot of like surprising reactions to what's going on from various different people who hold different beliefs. And it's been like, as everyone has said, an emotional roller coaster for sure. And um I've been like speaking with my mom and she's kind of made me like realize a lot of things and kind of open my eyes. Um, I actually, she sent me this TED talk that was very interesting that spoke about um, concession speeches and the importance of those. And, um, you know, given the current climate, um, how like, like, let's say Trump, if he does not give one, how that could drastically affect um, events to come. And it kind of made me, I, w I don't know if I would say scared, but very concerned and um, wanting to learn a lot more. And I feel like this um, dialogue in particular would help me try to learn more ways in how to interact with people who have opposing beliefs. Because I do believe that even though someone has different beliefs than you, it is very important to at least give them the opportunity to like say their side so you can get an understanding and then that'll help you find a way to better mediate whatever problems are going on. So I just feel like I can learn a lot from this conversation in particular for future events that are to come. And I think everyone else went, if I'm not mistaken. Seems so, everybody had a chance, right? Well, just thank you for you know, even just an initial go around asking for our intentions has already brought up so many critically important issues, especially that are, you know, personal to each of us. And I hope that we even get to fulfill, you know, a modicum of the, the hopes and intentions in the space today. Um, some of you already touched on the second question, but I, I think I'm going to go ahead and ask it anyway, because I think it's important to surface the things um, for each of us that um, have been most challenging um, in regards to the election. And, and if it isn't a specific thing that's most challenging, then whatever it is that you're really grappling with right now, you know, what are the things that you're really grappling with and struggling with? And I know a couple of you said that already, but um, not everybody did. So um, for the next question, just to be thinking about, you know, your major concerns or the, 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 what part of this experience has been most challenging. And I don't know if it's an honor to go first, <laughs> but since I'm the, the moderator, I go first. Um, and there have been so many things that are <laughs> challenging for me about this election. And as other people said, just the past four years in general, and um, one of one of the things just you know that has come up is just this idea that you know when when for me personally when Biden won the election I I felt my very confused like I felt relieved but not necessarily overjoyed and you know this kind of realization of like how traumatic in many ways like the last four years have been like having to interface with a lot of hate. Um, and so like I have, um, I haven't, I, so here's something that I'm really grappling with and I'll just, I won't, I'll try to not keep it too long winded, but my neighbors uh, have a Trump Pence sign on their lawn. And, you know, for me, 
um, knowing um, that orientation, uh, as far as like polarization goes, like they're they're nice neighbors. Um, they give me zucchinis from their garden when they have extra zucchinis, and when there's extra cookies, they bring them over for my stepson. And um, they're 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 cordial neighbors, and yet they have a Trump Pence sign outside, and I'm scared to let them know that I'm Jewish because. I don't know how they would react. And I've heard them talking about our Asian neighbors before. And um, I'm just really grappling with, you know, people who are, so in this, I'm just gonna be like, let it out. Like the fact that I have so many friends who are like, I know many Trump supporters and they're nice people. And if there's, and, and I don't disagree that they're nice people, but how do I actually integrate that with um, the fact that they're supporting policies that are the opposite of nice. Like, I don't, I don't know how to integrate this language of they're nice people. I guess that's like, I'm really, really grappling with that. And as I, you know, I've said to people, like I might have to change careers because like, if I can't figure this out, you know, like who can, because it's my job to be able to be open enough to be able to listen to people who have different perspectives. Um, but yet I have a really hard time saying, yeah, but they're nice. And that to me like contributes to this polarization problem. And, you know, um, I'm just, I'm unclear, you know, and I have this written down here and I don't know why, but this, this tension between being a bridge and being complicit in you know uh, discriminatory policies so i you know as far as like how i orient toward the to the world and you know this plays out in my classroom you know and you know the comments you know that others have mentioned that come on and how do we actually um humanize and at the same time not let go of the fact that there is something really troubling <laughs> about what some perfectly nice people are contributing to in the world. And um, I'm really struggling with that. So, Amanda. Yikes, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, Allison, um, for that. And also I have to echo what you've said in the sense that my whole, um, personal and professional career life has been predicated on this notion of radical inclusivity. Like every choice I've made has been one that has firmly been situated within this notion of radical inclusivity. And I am um, feeling violated by, the, by those, the ethics of radical inclusivity because I have such polarization even within myself here. I'm teaching classes and courses on polarization and emnification and understanding the necessity and the value of radical inclusivity. And yet, I don't know how to translate that into, um, into practice when I feel that same polarization that we're talking about and pointing at with others because, because regardless of um, the shared ground, the common ground that we have um, and again, I teach students all the time to find common ground, to find the shared reality and to work with that as a basis to try and bridge difference. I, I, I agree that it feels like collusion um, when, we, when, we, um, um, when we invite the humanity of people who have acted inhumanely. So, um, so I'm definitely struggling with that both personally and professionally how to um, how to make sense of that. That's, that's my struggle in the sense-making process. So thank you for naming that so clearly. Um, I'm going to choose Swasti. Yep. I mean, that's, you know, I, I, I talk about cultural humility and about understanding yourself and understanding others. And I'm just really struggling, you know, because I, again, my mother's words, you know, you need a strong internal locus of control. So I, what I do shouldn't be dependent upon the actions of others. And yet, how do I work for unity if you don't want to? And I, it's just hard and it's tiring. And, 
and my life is good, right? Compared to that meeting, I said, I was holding pain and I finally looked at them. I said, y'all the therapists, I don't know how to hold this. I mean, the pain was intense and deep. And I'm thinking, how do I speak to my other friend who is a nice person, but doesn't see the pain. So I'm struggling too, because if I'm struggling and I, and I mean, we are struggling and we try, how much more harder is it for those who this isn't even on their plate? And so I, yeah, I agree with both of you. Can you pick someone, Swasti? Um, Jeremy. Yeah, thank you guys for articulating that. I mean, I just to kind of echo Swasti, the 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 feeling that you described is maybe putting words to some of the experiences I've had over the last couple of weeks and, and even few months and years for that matter. But I, so I, two of them kind of came to mind and I think it, it's, it's, they both, both these kind of recent experiences have made me kind of notice what you were talking, some kind of illustrate what you were talking about. So one is that my, my older son goes to Boy Scouts and I went to Boy Scouts the, the night after, actually it was the night of the election. It was Tuesday night because he has Tuesday night Boy Scouts and two of the people of the parents in the Boy Scout troop showed up with Trump shirts on, which I wasn't so surprised at, but I was kind of surprised it was so outward. I mean, I, I assumed they were much more conservative than I, but I just was like, holy crap. And I just literally could not engage with them. I was like, I just can't deal with this right now. And I, and I, you know, and I was like struggling to figure out why can I not, and you know, as somebody who teaches peace and conflict studies, I was mad at myself in a way, because I was like, I should be able to get past this and engage with these people that have, I, I've engaged with in the past, you know, I mean, I've had conversations with them. They're quote, nice people, as you said, but I just was like, I, I just can't even look at them. Like I'm, I was just so frustrated and so angry. And so that was one experience. And then the other experience is I was a poll greeter uh, during the early voting here in North Carolina. And I got talking to a, a more conservative woman who was actually out stumping for a, a local party, a, lo a local Republican candidate. And I think she was a little closer to, I mean, I, we didn't really get real deep into it, but I, I assume she was still on the fence about whether to vote for Trump and frustrated with him, but leaning kind of in that direction. And uh, she, we, we just got talking and her neighbor is actually the guy, and I'd never even heard of the book, but he, he's a writer who wrote Ender's Game, which became a movie and, uh, and I haven't read it. And, and she said, she said, you haven't, you know, she was kind of shocked that I hadn't read it. And we, she, she was talking about it and telling me, you know, how, how it kind of articulated certain values and things. And I said, no, I don't, I'm not familiar with it. And, uh, and so she said, I'm, give me your address. I'm going to send you a copy. You know, I'm going to get him to sign a copy, in fact, and send it to you. And so I gave her my card, which is actually my, my office address. And I was in the office the other day and I, I kind of was like eager to go partly because I wanted to see if it was in my box. Like I wanted that, that experience of like, yes, yeah, she followed through and I don't care about the book. So much. I mean, I could get online and buy it or whatever, but I just wanted to see that she had followed through with that and had kind of, that we had made some kind of a connection that we could talk across those lines. And it wasn't there. I'll just, you know, and I'm, so I'm still kind of like hoping one day I'm going to go in and the book will be sitting from her assigned copy of this guy's book. And if it is, I, I, I'm going to read it. I'm like, you know, I'm like, I, I'll put it on the top of my list of things to read because I just want to have that kind of good feeling of like a connection that had been made across kind of party lines for lack of a better, for a lack of a better term. And so those two things, you know, what you guys said, just those those experiences have been uh, kind of swimming around in my head and, and kind of the, the frustration you expressed very eloquently about how to how to engage and of all people, we should be able to do that. But like the frustration of not and the guilt, I don't know if it's guilt as much for me as it is just kind of like frustration and aggravation that I can't figure out how to engage with with those people, those nice people. Um, who can I pick? How about, uh, how about Jace? Sure. 
Sorry, I'm taking notes. Um, so, so the question is, major concerns, what's been most challenging? Um, so I guess coming from a different perspective because uh, I didn't really get into politics or even really become aware of politics till well after Trump won. So it wasn't like this whole like, you know, mind blowing thing of, you know, me seeing the change of the political reality for me just is the, or I guess was slash is the political reality. So I guess, uh, you know, my experience is a bit more subdued. Like, uh, it also helps. I'm in a very liberal place. Like I grew up in Los Angeles and I went to school in Santa Monica. So you're not going to get uh, a lot of people with diverse political beliefs, at least in terms of like right, left. It's, you know, most people are at least going to be like, Biden left that's conservative in Santa Monica. So, you know, that's the scale we're talking about. But also, you know, I have family who are in the Central Valley, um, which in case you don't know, is it's like essentially the deep south in California. You get, you know, Confederate flags and, you know, uh, billboards with like, you know, Bible quotes. And then like Trump is like next to the Bible quote or whatever, you know, those sort of weird things. And, uh, it's interesting because uh, I have different political beliefs than most of my family. Because I also have family in Texas, and you know, the, if you thought California was bad, you know, wait till you hear about Texas. And so it's just, I guess, this whole polarization thing. Because I was more or less born into it, it, it hasn't had as as big of an effect because. You know, I spend most of my, when it comes to politics, I spend most of my life kind of like subconsciously navigating around the polarization to just kind of, you know, keep the family together because, you know, it's just, it's just the way things have been for uh, four years. But let's be honest, it's been, it's been there for a lot longer than four years, but it's definitely been worse in the past four years. And uh, yeah, that's, that's been a, uh, you know, I guess that's been my experience the last four years. And, you know, I'm, as as someone in politics, I'm also interested to see how it turns out. You know, I have a lot of ideas and theories as to why, uh, you know, this polarization is the thing as it is, and but I presume we'll get into that later. Uh, okay. Uh, Hannah, your turn. Thank you, Jace. Um, quick sidebar, Jeremy, please read Ender's Game. It's so good. I, it's so good on so many levels. Would recommend. Anyway, um, I really like when Allison, you, you, you said you, that you're feeling this tension between being a bridge and being complicit and that really struck a chord. Um, because obviously in a lot of peacemaking processes, and it's interesting that we all have this kind of familial connection with it of like trying to have these conversations with people we're related to, um, you want to find that common ground, but the common ground or what we assume the common ground to be on either side is so different. Like there are entire identities of people and experiences and atrocities and oppression that is to one side, a real lived experience. And to the other side, it's a fake narrative constructed by the media. Like it, it, it's an issue of trying to find a common ground that doesn't necessarily exist. And so, um, I don't know how much, oh, my dog is walking, um, how it's really possible. But then also you, you get this frustration with yourself of, of, you know, if you can't find a common ground with just the very basics that like the brass tacks of like, this is what people are living and experiencing, where do you find it? Or is it an issue of you have to just wait for like generational turnover, which is like kind of what the issue was with the gay marriage case in 2016. So I don't know, it, it puts the youth in a very volatile position. And I think I've just had concerns about, you know, where that's gonna take us and if it's gonna get there peacefully. Um, I think I would like to pop it to, Will have, Wim, have you gone yet? Uh, thank you, Hannah. Um, for a second there, I thought I was going to start crying hearing somebody talk about my hometown in Bakersfield so accurately. Um, 
So I had a friend or 15 who have blocked me or unfriended me or severed ties for me uh, in the last few years. Probably the most noteworthy example of this is I love people. I really have always wanted to be popular and liked by everyone. Um, and so, you know, I told racist jokes when I was in high school because I wanted to fit in and I knew it was wrong, but I didn't really mean it. But, you know, it's like everybody's doing it. And I tell these stories because I think one of the best ways to be the bridge is to say like the racism that we need to confront is the small acts of racism that happen around us all the time and not just the hate crimes like my friend who gave a keynote just a couple of weeks ago who had a man wearing a MAGA hat pointing a 357 revolver at him and his family and you know he shot it over their heads but he admitted he wanted them to leave. He doesn't want people that look like that in his area. And so I think about this very specific friend and this very specific friend's family and the part where it's only after, it's only after he tells me like, no, I'm not interested in talking to you and stop stalking people or whatever. And I'm just like, all right, we're done here. Like I, there's no effort left, but I'm reflecting about the part where his, his brothers, they would go downtown in this racist place that I'm from. And uh, 9 or 10 p.m. on a Friday or Saturday, they would yell racial slurs at people leaving the bars until they could get someone to fight them. And when that happened on one occasion, one of his brothers ended up sustaining his own head injury and got hospitalized. And the whole family was like up in arms, like you kick somebody's ass, but you don't do this. And I never spoke up to say they were committing a hate crime. And if somebody's targeting you because of your skin, you're not having a fight. You're, you're defending yourself for survival. And I think about that and how I didn't act. All of the different times where it's been showcased to me. And so it's clear to me. 2016 is just a product of a lot of experiences that add up. And I've had that confirmed to me by a large number of my friends who are of persons of color where they they didn't think that the pundits had it right when they called Hillary to win somebody I, I really value said yesterday that in 2016 she went to bed early because she knew what the outcome was going to be and she didn't even want to have to think about it and I think about how I write a dissertation on forgiveness, but it's actually my students of color who do the survey and talk to me about it, that they're like, you're not getting the part where if I don't figure out how to forgive the police officer for pulling me over for being black, I'll get fired because my boss doesn't want an angry black man, right? He wants a hardworking black man. But if I show up angry and I get pulled over every day, so we're trying to do it right. And I'm sometimes feeling a lot more like Allison than I wish because I've worked really hard to try to be a professor and it's like the jobs aren't there and I'm not sure I can do a good job. And it's, it's scary. And I feel like that's, if that's my biggest worry, that's a lot of privilege and I should be ashamed of myself. Um, Gail, have you talked this round? Well, thanks everyone for sharing up to now. Uh, I was thinking back to right after the 2016 election and I was teaching and I used a typical assignment with my students. I said, write a play with one of the philosophers we studied in a contemporary situation and have a drama that shows them applying their philosophy in a context. And Martin Luther King Jr. was one of the philosophers we did. I had several students in different classes all come up with similar scenario for Martin Luther King Jr. 
and it was all about uh, people protesting the government and an angry protester who wanted to hurt a policeman. And Martin Luther King Jr. would come down from heaven or something and say, stop, put down that rock. Don't hurt this policeman. And I thought, first of all, I thought this is odd. So many students are coming up with the same scenario. I worried, are they talking to each other? Are they copying? So I had them come in and talk about, do they want to rethink it, maybe write a second draft? And I had a student who said, but, but didn't you see all those rioters the day after Trump was inaugurated? And I said, the, ri the rioters or like, during, what rioters? She goes, what do you mean what rioters? And she started trying to find it on her phone. And I, realized after talking to a couple of them that that is how they experienced the Trump inauguration. Our guy is being inaugurated while angry protesters are using violence to try to take away what he won. And I scoured the news and I think I found one place where violence was used on a Trump supporter in Portland and, and nowhere else. But you know, that's the thing about film and that's the thing about capturing things on your phone and retweeting. You can just pick out, and I remember teaching this to my students. We did this study of newsreels during the 1930s and how they picked and chose their topic and where they put the camera angle to make the point they wanted to make about a protest and how you can just represent a protest in two very different ways, depending on how you film it and present it to your audience. And so when I try to understand how a relative of mine is like telling me on the phone, get inside your house. There's protesters live going down the street like a mile away from where I live. And she's like, get inside the house. And I'm like, uh, I'm sure I'm fine. I don't. I don't think I have to get inside the house. And she's like, oh, you know, and it's like, and her other responses where she's gasping and she is afraid that like Biden, right? And the Democrats are crazy anarchists who want to burn down USA. And she's seen things with her eyes. You know, they talk about with propaganda. You think you saw it. Because you saw it, you know it's true. You saw it on your phone. I can't tell you how many people go, I saw it and they're pointing to their phone. They know it happened, you know? So when I try to say, how can I find common ground with that person? I can say, we all know that as human beings, we're hardwired to believe what we see with our eyes. I mean, there's such interesting epistemology you can do in philosophy. And not, and not even just Western philosophy. You can talk about, you know, uh, the Jains and you can talk about, you know, how uh, Arvaka, I mean, there's all these debates also in Buddhism, you know, how do you know something is real? And and the media is, is you could say, demonizing the Democrats. And I saw a billboard Detroit, that showed, you know, we had a very close race between Gary Peters, the Democratic senator, and John James, the Republican. And right here on 8 Mile, the famous 8 Mile, right near where I live, was a huge billboard. And it showed somebody about to fill in a mark on a ballot. And there were two choices, John James or socialism. And they were filling in the circle next to James, the Republican. And this whole idea of demonizing the socialists is something our own government, unfortunately, has exported to Latin America, where we have intervened, you know, in other people's elections, helping to polarize those societies with this idea that 
socialism and communism are so bad, we're better off backing the right-wing dictators in whatever election they have. And to see these same methods coming home, you could say home to roost, and Republicans now using them at home. I mean, of course, there was McCarthyism, which did something similar. But how people can be taken in, and then what's the common ground? You don't want to see America destroyed. So can I reach out to someone? You're right. We don't want to see our society. You don't want it destroyed. I don't want it destroyed. We have this common value, but maybe we have to look closer. What would destroy America? And maybe like staying in power when you lost an election would do more harm to America than the protesters. And I've seen those studies, 98% of protests were nonviolent. It's hard to tell somebody who saw it all on their phone that. You know, and Trump also makes fun of that statistic all the time. Uh, so these are some of the challenges I think we have, you know, how to find that common ground. Okay. And now, who is to my, Jose is to my right. You have to unmute. Thank you, uh, Gail. Um, wow, <laughs> these are some hard acts to follow. Um, you know, um, we do have um, family members um, who were Trumpers, um, uh, and 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 a, a couple who are very good friends of ours. Um, the husband um, is a, is a you know, a longtime Republican, and he was a Trump, he's a Trump supporter. And, um, you know, how, you know, how do you find the middle ground? Um, I think what we ended up doing over these past few years was to avoid the topic. You know, um, we would just not talk about it. It would be like, uh, it wouldn't even be the elephant in the room because the elephant would be like outside somewhere. We would, it was so far away from our, our, our you know, consciousness because um, we, we were totally avoiding the topic and, and we would have very nice conversations with my cousins, you know, um, uh, but, but, you know, the, 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 the top, the top, you know, politics was definitely not our common ground. As my wife just told me, um, our friend, you know, when, when, um, you know, the only thing that we, he would say sometimes would be, um, you know, when they had the demonstrations in Philadelphia and they, they actually lived down, down, um, in center city, Philadelphia. Um, basically, you know, just saying, can you believe all the, all the looting that was going on? And that's all, basically, that's all he could see was the looting that was going on and, and, and the, the, the companies that had to, you know, the stores that had to board up their, their windows and their doors. And, and that was the, basically the only thing that he was processing at the time. Um, when, you know, as it was happening. And, and so, uh, but we, you know, but we just did not take the conversation any further, you know, um, you know, the fact that, that, that the vast majority of those people that were out there were peaceful protesters seemed to got, have gotten lost in his, in, in, in the way, in, in his thinking. So, so we basically avoided the topic um, most of the time. And we, we have a lot of contact with them um, we play bridge online with them um, many nights, um, and and uh, we have very pleasant uh, conversations. Uh, we have a you know nice uh, you know games with them, but it just doesn't come up. And so um, I, I, you know I'm I'm not a professor, uh, so I don't I don't have this great need to be now talking to students and trying to. Uh, reach out to people with 
different, you know, who have the different opinions, okay? But one of the things that, that I've asked myself and, and, and said it aloud many times over the past uh, couple of years is that, that how do intelligent people, the people who we know to be intelligent people, how can they look at this person, I won't name that person, and, and, and not see what he's all about. I mean, not understand what, what, what he does, what he says. Um, and and, and, and they don't, he doesn't care that he's so self-centered. He doesn't care about anybody but himself. Um, how, they, how do intelligent people look at this person and not, and not see it? Um, and I, I, and I, I, don't, I don't have an answer. I really don't have an answer. Has an answer. Um, and I don't know if anybody uh, in this room, uh, you know, has an answer to that. Um, uh, and they are, as far as I know, they're nice people. Um, but they just have this, 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 they, 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 you know, they don't watch the same news that I watch. Okay. They, they, they you know, the 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 conservatives the republicans they they don't they don't watch cnn they they watch fox news okay or they watch some of the other conservative news outlets um um it is it <laughs> interestingly enough uh was just suggested i was watching cnn earlier today that what is trump going to do when he is um you know out of office and um, someone suggested maybe he can take over Rush Limbaugh's program, you know, talk show on uh, on conservative radio. Um, and and I thought that myself that it's it's a it's a very good possibility. So that because he still wants to have, he still wants to have a voice. He wants to have a megaphone. He's got millions of supporters on uh, on Twitter. So he's not going away. He's he's going to be out of office but he's not going away um maybe to jail. and may well maybe to jail my wife says um but um but but you know i i don't have any answers as to how um how to um broach the subject with those people who are close to us and and try to understand from their point of view why they think the way they do um so um, I'm very, I've been very interested to hear some of the ideas that have, have been, have come out um, as we've been, as uh, the group has been talking. So thank you for uh, letting me speak for a while. Um, let me see who has not spoken. Uh, I think Brianne and Anna. Uh, 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 Bri uh, Brianne, okay, let's, let's hear from Brianne. Uh, um, yeah, so um, for me, I kind of touched on it a little bit in the first question, but um, I grew up in like Brooklyn, New York. So like where I grew up, there weren't really people around me who kind of had opposing beliefs or if they did, they didn't really showcase them. And um, I'm not sure if it's like, the current climate solely the reason but um since i've been at georgetown in dc i've seen like a lot more openness and like trump supporters and just a lot of opposing beliefs in general um but trump supporters especially and um to me it's been like a bit overwhelming because i don't really know how like to react because some people like some people are just like you know they had their flags and then there's some people that try to like interact with you or like get a reaction out of you and I don't know like to me sometimes it makes me feel a bit scared to go certain places and um so yeah that would be one of my biggest struggles like trying to find a way to kind of react to what's going on around me um, I'll pass it to Anna, since you're back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my hotspot turned off, so I, I left for 
brief while while I fix that. Um, I was just thinking as I listen to everybody, um, the polarization of the last four years is just, it's been, a. am in Wisconsin and since 2010, we've had a governor that was very polarizing. So like what's happening in the nation happened here starting in 2010 and he like broke the teachers unions and stuff like that. And there were, <laughs> there were protests that were on international news. Um, and we had a recall election. Like, so it's been happening here in Wisconsin for a decade. And this is just on top of that. And we do have a new governor who was elected in 2018, uh, but it's still just as polarized as before. And we're a swing state. So um, we've been <laughs> ripening ourselves for the, the last four years for a while. Um, and then thinking about like common ground, like it's hard to find common ground. Like now I'm going to be represented in Madison by somebody who believes in QAnon. And like, if we can't even agree on what facts are, like I, we aren't even at the same table. Um, like if I go to science and I say, there's a real pandemic, but somebody says, nope, somebody made that up. Like we, how are we supposed to even talk to each other? Um, it's just really hard to have common ground when you when it's really clear that people don't believe the same things because they're consuming media and don't really fact check stuff. I mean, I, I feel like any I try to fact check things all the time because you should call me out if it's incorrect. Um, and then, but it's also like another struggle is like if I try to like be somewhat in the middle like I, I live in a very, in a rural county with a lot of um, Republicans in the area. We have, we're gonna be represented by a QAnon believer um, that's racist and Islamophobic and all sorts of things that he's posted on Twitter and Facebook in the past. Um, like I need to be able to talk to people that clearly have beliefs that I don't think are right at all, but if I can't even talk to them, how do I, like it's not going to go anywhere if I just accuse them of being racist or whatever. Um, so sometimes on Facebook, people will be like, well, you shouldn't talk to those people anymore because um, because like they're hopeless. But it's like, but if they're hopeless, then we sh <laughs> it's just so, like you can't just say people are hopeless because I don't I mean, like, I don't know that people at the top are going to change a whole lot, but I think that the people in our own lives can change if we have personal conversations with them and kind of guide them towards things. Because if we can't have those conversations, I guess I should just move somewhere where everybody agrees with me, which isn't the answer. So um, yeah, so I feel like there's like struggles on all sorts of sides and they've been happening here in Wisconsin for a while. So I think Elias is the last in this cycle. Hi. Um, so honestly, I'm, I'm not exactly sure where to even start because um, I've, I've just been, I, I, I don't know if, I'll like, if I could pass, but I've been listening to everything everybody's been saying. And I think it's so like interesting how like even each state, everybody has like a different encounter, but all like the same conclusion. Like I was saying before that I mean, I, I just pray that everything that happens, at, like as a conclusion of this, everybody's okay. And like the polars, I, I don't know if it's possible, but for, I just hope that the polarization could kind of not be so bad as it is right now, because right now it's, in my opinion, at an all time high. <laughs> and I don't, I mean, there's many reasons as to why I believe that is, but I just, I, I just think that hopefully maybe one day could, we could all come back together and you know, not be as polarized. Thanks Elias. So here we are and we've brought a lot of um, issues and ideas into this space. And we've been here for an hour and 22 minutes and still have two more questions to go in the next eight minutes. So um, obviously that's not happening. So, um, you know, it's really important though, you know, in this kind of circle, you know, 
in an ideal world, we would all come together for a second circle, right? And continue this, this conversation um, and kind of address some of the stuff that we've talked about. Um, but the work that we've just done together is the work of building community around the issue. And that's just really important work to do before moving into um, any kind of um, action or um, solution. So um, please don't think that um, what we've done thus far, um, you know, uh, isn't critically important because it is. Um, and, you know, recognizing that, you know, we are in a moment where a lot of people are struggling with this and a lot of people have goodwill toward it, at least the people in this room that we have goodwill toward, you know, trying to figure out, you know, how we can close this gap on polarization and recognizing that there's so many challenges involved in, you know, stepping into that kind of role. Um, and also, um, fear <laughs> um, and this 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 challenge of you know um, what about other people doing the same kind of work should we be doing it if we're the only ones doing it there's so many questions that come up um, so as a last um, closing um, man I mean I wanted us to talk about you know bright spots um, things that we've done that have actually um, showed some kind of um, possibility in our lives. And we don't really have any time. We have six minutes left. And so the, the best we can do perhaps is um, maybe go around the circle and, and quite quickly um, maybe share um, an intention or a hope um, that we're going to take out from the circle into the world with us, um, into this complexity, into this challenge, um, maybe something that we can carry with us. Um, and I guess I have to start. <laughs> I can start if you want, Alison. Yay, you start. So um, I feel I feel really relieved by the connection that we've had in this conversation, just the affirmation of the complexity that we're facing. And I'm going to remember that as I move forward to bring that, um, to remember that conversations and connection really give me a lot of hope. Yeah, so I... I feel similarly and also feel like um, if there's a whole bunch of other people who are stepping into the role in the messiness too, that I'm actually not alone doing it, that there's, you know, that you're all with me as I travel, right, as I go into those spaces. And so that kind of community building for me provides that kind of, you know, support. So I'm going to take that with me and um, I will pass it to... Let's go Elias. Let's see. Let's, let's go Elias with his hope. So I, I know I've said this twice already, but um, I'm hoping that, well, how about this? I'll change it. Uh, what I am going to bring and take away from this meeting that we had today is, I guess, kind of perspective. I'm going to think of in a more empathetic way towards like certain situations that like, because one thing my mom always says, you never know what people are going through. Like, and just to remember that, like when you're talking to somebody, the surface, they may seem completely okay, but down inside, they might have something like some struggles that are going on with them. And that's just going to be something that I'm going to really magnify throughout these next few weeks as we see what happens with this whole mess. <laughs> Um, do I have to pass it to somebody or are we just going? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, pass Okay, it. I will pass it to Wim. Um, I was almost going to propose, you know, there's no reason we'd have to end on time or something, but I'm sure there's a lot of people like, actually, there's very big, important reasons we have to end on time. We're not alone, so that's hopeful. Um, the most important wisdom that I've carried with me from my father, uh, who passed away 10 years ago, uh, came when I was in a really, really low point working in Sri Lanka after the 2004 tsunami. And he paraphrased Mother Teresa's quote of uh, not needing to do great things, but to do small things with great love. And we see instances of things like that teenagers like Anne Frank, 
who told us like, it's amazing that we can start to change the world right now. Um, in this moment, we can be better people. We can make a better planet. Um, my hope is that it might not be as often as I'd like, but I did get a message earlier this year from somebody who said, I want to thank you because five years ago, I argued with you about Ferguson and I argued with you about gun control and stuff, but you planted the seeds then that now when I saw George Floyd was executed by a police officer, I got it. And um, sometimes we just plant the seeds and somebody else has to help water them. Sometimes we have, you know, but I think, I think I do see um, reasons that we should feel hopeful and stay hopeful. Um, Jose, you're up next. Here, you have to unmute. So, so I, I, I'm going to um, the end with a note of optimism. Okay. And um, it's, it, it is based in, on some reality. Um, as, we, as we all know, uh, you know, Trump has demonized uh, blue states, he's demonized Democrats, he's branded Democrats as uh, communists and socialists, okay? Joe Biden uh, is going to be an excellent president. He is going to put us on the world map again, um, as it was stated by the mayor of Paris, I believe, um, who, who's tweeted out, Welcome back, America. Okay, so he's going to he's going to improve our standing in the world, or he's going to bring us back into the world. He is going to work with Republicans because he's done that before uh, successfully. Uh, one of his best friends when he was a senator was John McCain, a Republican. He's done it before. And so I think what we're going to see is we're going to see Republicans and Democrats working together to pass some very uh, key laws. And, 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 and in fact, immediately we're going to start passing some laws to, to, um, to help the poor people and the workers in, in, in our country with relief, um, which Trump had refused to do and Mitch McConnell had refused to do, guess what? Biden is gonna get him to do it. And, um, and over the next four years, we'll see that people will see, oh, gee, Republicans and Democrats can get along together and they can, uh, they can govern and they can do things and they can make our lives better. So that's my note of optimism. Maybe it's naive, but um, I want to, at least I want to be hopeful. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, I need to call on somebody. Um, I'll call on uh, Jace. Um, so, sorry. Um, so yeah, I'll probably just go, because I'm also, I'm a very optimistic guy. It's kind of like, my thing is optimism to a point of it's kind of silly. Uh, the, I'm also a history nerd, and so I, I like looking at the patterns of history and seeing you know, how things go. And one of the things I remind myself a bit is that this isn't the first time the United States has gone through a tumultuous period in its history, and it won't be the last time. Every generation has its, you know, big thing. Uh, you know, my parents, well, I guess my parents had it a bit easier than the rest, but you know. My grandparents had to deal with the 1960s with Vietnam and the civil rights. My great grandparents had to deal with the worst economic disaster in the history of mankind and then the worst conflict in the history of mankind right after that. And so I just know that as long as we put in the effort, we can repeat history by defeating the roadblocks ahead of us and push forward to guarantee the next generation can exist and deal with the challenges that come before them. Yeah. Uh, who hasn't gone? Anyone want to call? Uh, Hannah, have you gone? Hannah, let's go. Um, thank you. I would like to just highlight something that I found kind of comforting. Um, 
a lot of you guys expressed that you guys had um, like more conservative um, Trump supporting family members. And as someone who goes to a very liberal college, but is from a very conservative area, it's nice knowing that other people have similar skeletons in their closet of their family tree. So that's kind of, I don't know, it's nice to know that I'm not alone and having that awkward conversation with my grandmother. So um, anybody else who has any going? Jeremy, Anna, Swasti. Swasti, take it away. Jose, when you were talking, I thought from your, what is this the saying from your mouth to God's ears? <laughs> you know, but, and, and Jace as well. I mean, I try to be positive. I'm the glasses half full um, type of person. It's nice to know. I mean, what am I taking away that I'm not alone and that, you know, we will see. I mean, it's, it's the choices we make daily that can determine at least our lives, the trajectory of those, and hopefully that intersects with others. Um, Jeremy. Yeah, I'll follow the optimism theme and just say, uh, you know, election night, I was watching CNN, and I don't remember who it was, but one of their folks said, um, you know, empathy beats strength which Trump's motto has always been that strength always beats empathy, right? But, but in this case, we saw the reverse of that happen. And so I, I hope that that continues, that we realize that empathy does, does actually, in the end, beat strength. Um, yeah, and I think Anna is the last one. Um, I think... I think it was just hopeful. I'm sitting at home for a month on end and I do, I do interact with people outside, but it's nice to talk to people who want, um, want like peace and like goodness to reign in the world. Not that people here don't, but just <laughs> to, to interact with people who are talking specifically about that. And um, uh, yeah, I think it was, it was just good to be able to talk with people who, who do agree on, um, and making that happen, but also trying to like, on some level, figure out how to make that hap happen in a very, like, cause it's such a complicated thing. So it was good to be able to um, just have, have lots of interactions with people that were positive. Sorry, I'm just rambling now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for being part of this circle. And thank you, Allison, for your questions and facilitation. And I, I hope we'll see you in some of the subsequent sessions that we have on polarization at the PGSA conference. There's still another week or two of events that you are welcome to attend. And, um, and good luck. May, may, may positive things continue to unfold for all of us and for this country. Yeah. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. You too. I do think it's awesome, though, that we talk about the challenge and complexity, and then here we emerge, you know, still willing to, to, to be in a space of hope and positivity. And hopefully that's not, as my dad says, naive. <laughs> but yes, thank you, everybody. And uh, look forward to future conversations. Thank you for joining us. That was a delight. <laughs> thank you. Be well. Bye. Stay safe, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. For those that are attending the trauma and trauma healing tools in three and a half hours, see you there. Oh gosh, I don't know. <laughs> that was recorded. <laughs> <laughs> Take care of me.